trial, and the judge agreed, setting a date of October 23rd, less than two months from now. Trump's lawyers quickly weighing in, saying that's way too early to put the former president on trial. Aaron Katursky is there in Georgia for us. You've been there all week. Talk about this mugshot just released a few moments ago. And also, let's talk about what happened at the jail tonight, Aaron. It's an incredible image of former President Trump, who's one of the most widely photographed people in the country, if not the world. And that's why a mugshot was not required in three other jurisdictions where he has been criminally charged. But here, the sheriff was determined to make sure that Trump was treated like every other criminal defendant who comes to this jail for booking. So the mugshot was taken. He was fingerprinted and the jail deputies recorded his height and weight that had been provided by his staff. He did not have to be weighed or measured on site. All told, the former president was here at the jail for less than a half hour before he was gone and headed to the airport. And it marked the first time, Stephanie, that a United States Secret Service motorcade has ever been inside the confines of a state jail facility. Certainly an incredible scene there, Aaron. And, and this booking just marks another first. We just keep uh, hitting on all of these firsts. The first time a motorcade is heading to a jail and the first time that a former president is booked and a mugshot taken of them. A mugshot taken and a former president being required to post bond under the terms worked out with the district attorney's office. The former president uh, was released on a $200,000 bond. He needed to post 10% of that in order to be released. And he did that, we're told, with the help of a local bail bondsman, just like many of the other criminal defendants who show up here and who are charged uh, along with Trump in this sprawling racketeering indictment. But that image of the former president glowering into the camera, uh, certainly representative perhaps of, of how the former president feels at the airport under the wing of his private plane. He told reporters that uh, the indictment shouldn't have been brought. He said he had a right to challenge the results of, of an election that he believed was dishonest. Of course, the former president was given that right. He filed more than 60 lawsuits and he lost all but one of them. An extraordinary night, and, and you said it there, Aaron, the president, the former president, not budging from previous statements that we've heard over and over again. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, with me now is ABC News contributor Kim Whaley. Kim, as a lawyer, what is your reaction to all of this? The United States now has a former president who has been indicted for the fourth time and who's now had his mugshot taken in a jail. We all know the adage, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? It, it's really unbelievable to look at that. I would say from the standpoint of the law and the rule of law, the notion that we have a set of of rules that orders our society that we've collectively agreed on and, and everyone should be held accountable for violating the rules, it is a vindication of the rule of law. But it, you know, it's also in the eye of the beholder. I think that sort of menacing, determined look is also gonna, going to read to the beholder, those his supporters, as, listen, I'm going to fight for my version of the Constitution. I'm going to vote for him. I'm going to donate or whatever. Um, he is, really understands how to capture the imagination and the spirit of people, unfortunately, through lies and deception. Um, but I I think there, there, you know, two ways of looking at this. It's a, it's a triumph, and it's probably something that people across the globe are seeing. Okay, America is still with us in terms of being a, a, a land of accountability. Um, but then for others, it's going to just be uh, a reason to sort of fight harder for this other version of democracy, which really isn't democracy, but but what he really represents uh, for for millions of Americans in this moment. Exactly. How will that mugshot play a role for his supporters and those who are against? Uh, talk, let's talk about the Supreme Court. Uh, the former president has mentioned uh, the Supreme Court stepping in, wanting the Supreme Court to step in. Is that a possibility? And, and if so, under what legal theory? Stephanie, I think it's inevitable uh, that there's going to be, uh, in maybe even all four cases, motions filed to either throw out parts of these indictments or at least to keep evidence out on the theory that he took some of these actions when he was still president of the United States. Um, there is a judge-made 
idea out there of presidential immunity. It's not in the Constitution, but it flows from this idea of commander in chief. Listen, we we vote on a president to have discretion to make decisions and make judgments, and sometimes they are not popular. Uh, and I think that the, the, the argument's going to be, listen, some of this activity, even if we don't like it what Donald Trump did it, we need to keep it within the powers of the presidency. So I think those motions will be filed. The, the district court, the lower trial judges are going to rule on them. They'll go to the appellate court, and it's going to be hard for the Supreme Court. Uh, here, five conservative justices um, in a 7-2 decision. They voted against him when he wanted to use presidential immunity to keep his accounting records from the Manhattan DA. But we don't know because that case didn't involve an indictment of a former president. That case didn't involve communications with his Department of Justice, uh, communications with his, his chief of staff, those kinds of Oval Office, high-level high uh, decisions. Now, N President Nixon tried it with his, um, with his Watergate tapes and lost unanimously. But we have a different Supreme Court, and he was never indicted. So uh, I think that, from a constitutional standpoint, is going to be important, and it might be decided by our friends in robes who are unelected. Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, the Court of Public Opinion. Kim, thank you so much. Let's get to John Santucci now. John, we have now seen this mugshot. We have spoken about it, but let's talk about it some more. Uh, what do you make of it? It is an intense look. He, the, pre the former president looks angry. What do you make of this mugshot, John? I, I think you hit it right there. Donald Trump looks it, and he is indeed extremely angry and plays in Stephanie to everything we've been hearing for the last couple of days and weeks that he has been extremely angry about this indictment in particular uh, and attacking DA Fawny Willis. And, and really, in part, Stephanie, Donald Trump angry about the indictment against himself, but angry about all the other people that have been pulled into this because obviously now the big concern is twofold for Team Trump, right? All the legal bills that everybody is going to look to see Donald Trump and others pick up. We know that Rudy Giuliani, among others, have lobbied Donald Trump to help pay for their legal defense, but also for Team Trump, how to keep all 19 on the team. So the biggest concern right now, from what I am told, is that if anyone, any one of those other 18 co-defendants flips against Donald Trump, that they know will make the case stronger against the former president and just make things all the more difficult. And John, like you've covered the former president for a decade. Have you heard from any of your sources about how this evening has played out for Trump once he boarded that plane back to New Jersey and, and just how he may be feeling right now? You know, I haven't spoken to anybody, Stephanie, uh, since he has been airborne. My sense is um, that he was rather, you know, leaning into the fact that he knew he had to go through this for the last couple of days. As I said, angry for sure. Um, but, you know, not something that he is unused to. To at this point. I do know, as we've reported here, uh, the fact that he had to take a mugshot was bothering him. The fact that it had to come out uh, was bothering him. But now, as we're going to see very shortly, I, I, I'd say soon enough, Donald Trump and his team are going to take that photo, put it into an email, blast it out for fundraising, and before you know it, there will be a t-shirt with that mugshot front and center. As they move forward in their campaign for the 2024 election, John Santucci, thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go to former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons. Uh, Chris, the world has now seen for the first time a former president of the United States take a mugshot at a jail there in Georgia. From a legal perspective, what kind of role can a mugshot play in the courtroom of a criminal case, if at all? Sure. So, so when I was a prosecutor, Stephanie, I would use mugshots in closing arguments all the time. And so a mugshot like that in a RICO case for a prosecutor is fantastic. You look at all the mugshots that we've got if you want to show the, the array of the mugshots on the screen. But you can look at them and you can say, who looks like they're involved in a RICO conspiracy and who doesn't? If you look at Jenna Ellis's photograph, she's smiling. She almost looks like she's in a, a sorority composite. Uh, but you know, in terms of trial, that's a smart move. Uh, it's a risky when you're taking a mugshot to smile on the mugshot because it suggest that you don't take the charges seriously. But when we're looking at these uh, mug shots, you, you take a look at particularly Rudy Giuliani in the bottom uh, left-hand corner of your screen. He looks like somebody who's involved in a RICO conspiracy. He looks like a member of an organized crime conspiracy. Contrast that with Jenna Ellis, who's up in the top right, second from the end. She looks like she's at a picnic. Again, the message she's sending to the general public is that I don't take these charges seriously. But I'll tell you what, as a prosecutor, I'm not necessarily going to use Jenna Ellis's photograph in the closing argument. I guess I'm going to have to because of everybody else 
I'm, I'm going to use them, uh, but hers in particular is troubling. The Trump mugshot, that's a terrible picture. I, I'm sure he's trying to show the United States that he's not afraid of these charges, that he's angry, and that he's ready to fight. And that actually plays into this case. You've got kind of two different cases going on anytime you're going after a high-profile individual with a big reputation. The first case is the case that's going on in the court of public opinion. And that's really what Donald Trump cares about. That's what these high-profile defendants care about. They want the general public to think of them as somebody who is being railroaded, somebody who's being unfairly targeted. And so a mugshot like that says to the general public, I'm being railroaded, I'm being targeted, but I'm gonna fight back. The other mugshots, though, say that, oops, didn't need me to stop. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're seeing the president. Uh, but with regard to uh, the other mugshots as well, when you're smiling, it says you don't take it seriously, but that's good for trial. So the second trial that's going on outside the court of public opinion is the trial that's going on in the actual courtroom itself. And so when I design a closing argument, particularly a final closing argument, when I was a prosecutor, I like to use those mugshots. It shows a defendant at their worst. And in this case, Donald Trump's mugshot shows somebody that looks like the head of a crime family. Now, we're gonna see motions coming up from the defense side that's gonna, they're gonna move to keep those mugshots out of evidence. And we're gonna see a hearing about it. But my opinion is, since they're wearing clothes, normal street clothes, as opposed to being dressed like prisoners, those mugshots are gonna come in. They'll probably remove um, from the top corner where you see the Sheriff's Department's logo. That'll be redacted, uh, but you're gonna see those mugshots back at trial. And so, Jenna Ellis is smart here if she wants to win the case. Donald Trump, that's gonna hurt him at trial, but it's probably gonna help him in the court of public opinion. And we'll certainly find out if those comments that he made before he boarded his plane will help him or, or hurt, her, hurt him. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate your time. Let's go to ABC's Olivia Rubin, who has been outside the Fulton County Courthouse. Olivia, what is the ripple effect uh, from Trump's mugshot on his campaign? Well, on the campaign, I think, as John Santucci just laid out, they are going to use this mugshot. They're going to blast it out already. You can see that his campaign has posted it on Twitter from their official campaign account. The former president himself has posted it on his Truth Social account. But while, Stephanie, they are using this mugshot for a campaign tool, the actual legal case is very much moving forward, even though the president, former president just got his mugshot here. If you look at the docket in this case, there have already been a number of legal filings, and it's really just going sort of at a breakneck speed, quite frankly. Next, in, sorry, in the next two weeks, the former president has potentially an arraignment to come down to unless he waives it. And then his legal team, Stephanie, has already filed asking a judge for a preliminary hearing here in the case. And what that is about is an effort to sort of pump the brakes on an effort from other defendants in the case, Trump's own co-defendants, -def co trying to speed up the trial, trying to get things underway already. We already have a trial set for October 23rd. So Trump's attorneys have come in and said, wait, that's not what we want. We need a trial here and we will sever this case so that we are not on that speedy track because that is not what Trump wants. So again, there is the campaign messaging of the mugshot and then there is the very real reality of the legal case that is going on here and that is really just getting started here in this courthouse that we have been at all day. And Olivia, the former president is facing a few hurdles there in Georgia. Let's talk about the pardon and 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 how how what how he faces that, whether he would get a pardon or not get a pardon there in the state of Georgia. Well, the pardon is going to be something, Stephanie, that's very difficult for him here because it is not a federal case. So the president does not have, whoever it may be, does not have the power to issue a pardon point blank for this case here. But then there is also the fact, as we've discussed, that the governor in Georgia, unlike other states, does not have pardon power here, Stephanie. That is because of the state constitution here. So even if the governor here, Brad Kemp, wanted to give Trump a pardon and they do not have a good relationship based on what we know publicly, he could not do it. So the way pardons work here in Georgia does not bode well for the former president. It is an independent board that has the authority to issue pardons here. But here's the real catch, Stephanie, is that in the state of Georgia, you are not eligible for a pardon until five years after you've already served your sentence. And that is something that is very difficult for the former president because that would mean that he would have to be convicted, sentenced, 
serve the term, Stephanie, wait another five years, and then apply. So that is not at all what the former president wants to hear. So even if it is successful that he can push the other federal cases until after the 2024 election, pardon himself, that is not anywhere near an option that he has on the table, quite frankly, here in Georgia. That's certainly not something he would like to see. Olivia, thank you so much. Let's go to ABC legal contributor Asha Rangappa. Asha, you are a former FBI special agent as well. How bizarre of an experience must it have been for the agents assigned to the former president's detail to accompany him to all of these cases and to accompany him to the Fulton County Jail earlier this evening? Yes, well, this is a clashing of worlds, I guess. Um, you know, as... Secret Service agents, they're there to protect him from the general public, and they're taking him into a secure facility where there are other law enforcement officers who are there to, you know, protect the public. It's it's very bizarre. I think that one thing that we need to imagine is, and, and this is sort of the bizarre world that we're in, is, you know, fast forward to some point where in any of these cases, Trump is convicted and faces actual jail time, he is entitled to Secret Service protection for the rest of his life. Um, you know, that's uh, a statutory benefit that he gets unless he is unless he had been uh, convicted in his impeachment and removed, uh, he would have lost that, but obviously that didn't happen. So, you know, we're looking at a future where what would that look like? What happens when a former president who's entitled to Secret Service protection, um, you know, gets convicted and goes to jail. These are the kinds of things that we're facing now. It's very far down the line, but we are now looking at things that we may not have ever imagined before, like having a former president have a mugshot released. And and today has, has certainly been historic. No president, former or current president, has ever been indicted. Here we saw the former president there going to a jail, getting his mugshot, indicted for the fourth time. What does all of this mean for the rule of law, specifically when it comes to elections, as the former president intends to run again for president in 2024? Yeah, I think there's two sides to this, right? I mean, one is that it's frankly tragic that this is what it's come to, that a former president uh, has not only been indicted, but has been indicted four times and for very serious crimes, including trying to upend uh, a pillar of democracy. On the other hand, one of the pillars of democracy is the rule of law and the idea that no one is above the law. And I think what you're seeing is really a robust expression of federalism in, in our country, where not only the federal government, Jack Smith, has been able to bring indictments for January 6th, but also uh, class, the illegal retention of classified documents in Mar-a-Lago, but that states have been able to step up. And I think that's something that's really important here when it comes to elections, because you know the bulk of the administration of elections goes is done by the states. This is a state interest. And I think it's really important to emphasize that what Fannie Willis is doing here is vindicating something that belongs to the sovereign of the state that is was a, a harm, um, an injury to the voters there. And it's a different kind of injury than the one that Jack Smith is charging Trump for for January 6th, which really is about you know, our government and, and the attack on our government and, uh, you know, civil rights writ large. Um, and so I think this is a vindication for the rule of law, but I don't think we should, you know, be celebrating it necessarily because it is certainly a black mark in, I guess, our judgment or, you know, who we've decided to put in charge of uh, our, you know, precious democracy here. Uh, a black mark on, on this country's history, for sure. I want to get your closing thoughts on, on today and how the simple existence of this mugshot sets this case aside from others. What do you think? Well, I think it is a precursor to the, the fact that this particular case is going to have a very 
visceral impact on the public in a way that maybe the others don't. Now, remember, this is a mugshot. This is going to be shared on social media. As John said, it's going to be put on T-shirts, et cetera. But this is just the beginning. Um, it, it looks like the rest of the proceedings here in Georgia are going to be televised. And I'm old enough to remember the O.J. Simpson case, which riveted the nation. And, you know, since then, we have had lots of celebrity trials and all these things. Basically, once you televise something, everyone becomes a juror in a way. Everyone gets to see what is being presented. They get to come to their own judgments. And it can't be filtered through, you know, it's not just filtered through court pictures and, and reporters. They get to make their conclusions for themselves. And I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, and it will be something that makes, I think, this case very different than the ones that we've seen so far. And as you said, this is just the beginning. There's still so much more to unfold uh, within this process. Asha, thank you so much. It bears repeating just how much of a historic moment we witnessed today and just how it'll impact the race for the presidency in 2024 is anyone's guess. We'll take a look at what else is at play on the campaign trail when we come back. There is still much more to get to here on Prime. A car slams into a swimming pool. The crime, police say, it was involved in before the crash. Uh, but next, the new details in the mystery plane and presumed death of a man behind a failed revolt in Russia. What Vladimir Putin is saying about the case. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show with President Biden in Ireland, I'm Karen Travers. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. The first presidential primary debate is in the books. Eight Republican candidates fought for airtime. Missing from the stage was, of course, the front runner. Who made the strongest impression? Senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has more. <laughs> Donald Trump was not in the debate hall, the frontrunner's presence loomed large. If former President Trump is convicted in a court of law, would you still support him as your party's choice? Please raise your hand if you would. <laughs> then former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie speaking up. Someone's got to stop normalizing this conduct. Okay? Now, and now whether or not, whether or not you believe that the criminal charges are right or wrong, the conduct is beneath the office of President of the United States. 
defending Trump at every turn. Biotech entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy. President Trump, I believe, was the best president of the 21st century. It's a fact. The 38-year-old multimillionaire from Ohio on his biggest stage yet. So first, let me just address a question that is on everybody's mind at home tonight. Who the heck is this skinny guy with a funny last name? But Ramaswamy's opponents not holding back. I've had enough already tonight of a guy who sounds like ChatGPT standing up here. And the last person in one of these debates, Brett, who stood in the middle of the stage and said, what's a skinny guy with an odd last name doing up here was Barack Obama, and I'm afraid we're dealing with the same type of amateur. Now is not the time for on-the-job training. And after Ramaswamy said he would not support increased funding for Ukraine. If you have no foreign me, policy experience, and it shows. And you know what? The foreign policy experience that you Working to stay out of the line of fire, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Do you believe in human behavior is causing climate change? Raise your hand if you do. Well, look, we're not school children. Let's have the debate. I mean, I'm happy to take it to start. <laughs> DeSantis reluctant to take on Trump. Mike Pence pushing him to say whether the vice president did the right thing on January 6th. I think the American people deserve to know whether everyone on this stage agrees that I kept my oath to the Constitution that day. There's no more important duty. So answer the question. I've answered this before. So yeah. Our thanks to Rachel for bringing us that debate recap. Vladimir Putin breaks his silence on the mysterious plane crash that reportedly killed mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin, who led a mutiny against Russian forces two months ago. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge is in Ukraine. Tonight, Vladimir Putin breaking his silence after that private jet belonging to mercenary boss Yevgeny Prigozhin broke up midair, crashing to the ground with U.S. officials now saying it's likely Prigozhin was killed. Prigozhin and Putin close allies before the mercenary boss and his men marched on Moscow. Putin calling that a stab in the back. Today, the Russian president initially offering what he called his sincerest condolences to the families of all 10 victims on board the plane. But then calling Prigozhin someone with a complex destiny and making a veiled reference to that mutinous march on Moscow, saying the Wagner boss made, quote, serious mistakes in life. Tonight, new details on what may have caused Prigozhin's plane to suddenly plunge from 28,000 feet. The Associated Press reporting that a preliminary U.S. intelligence assessment found the crash was intentionally caused by an explosion. The Pentagon not commenting on whether there was an explosion on board, but ruling out the idea that a missile shot the plane down. Nothing to indicate, no information to suggest that there was a surface-to-air missile. Today, supporters of Prigozhin laying flowers outside Wagner's offices in Russia, with a Ukrainian official claiming Wagner fighters who moved to Belarus after their failed mutiny and now heading back into Russia. Ukrainian President Zelensky saying Ukraine played no part in bringing Prigozhin's plane down, saying everyone understands who is involved. Tom Sufi Burridge joins us now from Ukraine. Tom, Ukraine is now trying to appeal to Wagner fighters? Yes, Stephanie, Wagner fighters were very loyal to Yevgeny Prigozhin. Tonight, the Ukrainian military appealing to those fighters who have not committed war crimes to join Ukraine and to finish their march on Moscow. Stephanie? An interesting turn of events. Thank you so much, Tom. Back here, new details about a deadly mass shooting at a biker bar in Orange County, California. The 465th mass shooting in America this year. Three people and the shooter were killed, five others wounded. Authorities say the shooter was a retired police sergeant and was targeting his estranged wife. Here's our Will Carr. Tonight, authorities believe the retired police officer who opened fire at this Orange County bar killing three was targeting his estranged wife. We have a significant number of patients, possibly totaling nine. It was just around 7 p.m. last night. Patrons gathering at Cook's Corner Bar to hear a live band and enjoy spaghetti night. When authorities say John Snowling started shooting, striking his estranged wife, Marie, in the face. She was rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Mr. Snowling, the suspect, then 
started randomly shooting at patrons within Cook's Corner. There is a massive police presence by the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Sources tell ABC News investigators believe when Snowling was out of ammo, he ran to his vehicle. Orange County Sheriff's deputies had arrived on scene confronting Snowling against his truck. The suspect began firing multiple rounds at our deputies. Multiple deputies were involved in the shooting, and we do know and do believe that it was a gunfire from those deputies that ultimately took the life of the individual. Tonight, the sheriff crediting his deputies' quick response for preventing a bigger tragedy. Undoubtedly, uh, more individuals may have lost their lives. So tragic. Our thanks to Will Carr. Maui County is suing multiple electric companies saying their inactions were negligent and responsible for the death of more than 100 people following this month's deadly wildfires. The lawsuit says despite red flag warnings, Maui Electric Company and Hawaiian Electric Company failed to power down electrical equipment, alleging the downed power lines sparked the initial flames. An official cause of the fires has not yet been determined. More than one 1,000 people remain unaccounted for. Tonight, the severe weather hitting the Great Lakes is making its way to the northwest. Flooding closed part of Interstate 90 near Cleveland. Some drivers even abandoned their cars. And in Detroit, more than 150 flights canceled. Meantime, this historic August heat wave shattered more records today. Chicago saw a heat index of 118, tying the record set in 1995. ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Hey there, Rob. Hi, Stephanie. Yeah, in Chicago, the actual air temperature was 100. That's the first time they've hit 100 in August since 1991. So a historic heat wave continues, although they'll get a bit of a break, as you'll see here in a minute. Storms are refiring across the Great Lakes after that rough morning, especially in Ohio and Detroit. And that's the problem areas. Again, look at that explosion through Grand Rapids, Detroit around midnight, then Cleveland, Columbus, Pittsburgh, and then probably holding together and firing up some as they get into the I-95 corridor from Philly to New York right around the rush hour. So it could be a rough go in the morning. As mentioned, though, this is cooling off the northern part of this heat wave, but not so much the southern. Houston hit a temperature of 109 today. That ties the all-time record, actual temperature. These are heat index values, which folds in the humidity. Dallas, Houston, Tampa, New Orleans, you can see, still relentlessly oppressive as we head towards the beginning of the week. And we're watching the tropics, of course. Franklin's now through the uh, Dominican Republic into the open Atlantic. But look at that trouble scenario in the Western Caribbean. That has a 60% chance of developing into a tropical cyclone and getting into the Gulf of Mexico by the beginning of next week. So we're watching that system, especially folks who live in Florida, watching it very closely. Stephanie. So much to watch. Thanks so much, Rob. FIFA is investigating whether a Spanish soccer official violated conduct by kissing a World Cup champion on the lips. Spain Soccer Federation President Luis Rubiales kissed player Jenny Hermoso on the lips during the trophy and medal ceremony Sunday after Spain's win over England. Hermoso says she didn't like the kiss, calling on FIFA to review the case. Minutes before, Rubiales was seen grabbing his crotch as a victory gesture with the queen and 16-year-old princess of Spain standing nearby. We still have much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, new issues with Boeing's embattled 737 MAX planes, the defect the company just discovered. But next, the top polling GOP candidates faced off on stage last night. We take a look at the first Republican debate by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. Imagine if you had an institution where it was almost impossible to be held accountable. What happened with the police made me scared of them. No mother should have to bury their child. Amir Locke was killed in a botched no-knock warrant situation. How these cops operate in this country has been America's dirty secret. Because of the color of his skin, he didn't have a chance. That's the sound of the police. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. The first debate of the 2024 election cycle is officially in the books. And while which candidate came out on top may be a matter of opinion, these facts and figures are not. Here's a Republican debate by the numbers. Eight GOP hopefuls cleared the bar set by the Republican National Committee and accepted the invitation to Milwaukee. Sparks flew for just over two hours inside the Fiserv Forum, 123 minutes from top to bottom. That's with commercial. When it comes to speaking time, former Vice President Mike Pence led the way, commanding the audience for 12 minutes and 37 seconds. Political upstart Vivek Ramaswamy and his frequent sparring partner for the night, Chris Christie, were second and third respectively, each tallying more than 11 minutes at the mic. Despite skipping the debate, frontrunner and former President Donald Trump still ate up airtime, mentioned more than 20 times by the moderators and his opponents. A New York Times analysis found that the only topic talked about more than Trump was abortion, which candidates debated for seven minutes and 54 seconds. The border, Ukraine, and the economy were also hot topics, but despite an explicit question about gun violence in America, the issue only garnered 25 seconds of discussion. One politician mentioned more than Trump was President Biden. Between the president and his son, the Bidens came up over 40 times, not surprisingly, nearly all of them attacks. Republicans will get another shot 34 days from now in the second debate at the Ronald Reagan Library in California. The bar for entry, however, will be higher. And while Trump has said he plans to skip that debate as well, a lot can happen between now and then. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime. The new developments in the case of a U.S. reporter detained in Russia. How much longer he'll be held before a trial? And it's long been a controversy in the Garden State how the governor could be ending the debate over the existence of central New Jersey. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? 
You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Welcome back. New York's governor makes a plea to President Biden. Boeing finds a new defect in its 737 MAX planes. And New Jersey's governor puts a major debate to rest. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. New York Governor Kathy Hochul says the state cannot handle the amount of incoming migrants without the federal government's help, that New York has spent about $1.5 billion, and New York City estimates it will spend $12 billion sheltering and assisting migrants who arrive in that city. Governor also announcing today that the state would help migrants find work in New York. Let them get the work authorizations. Let them work legally. Let them work. Wednesday night could have ended much differently for Kirk Kramer and his two kids. And then, I mean, we found these and I, we're glad we went to eat, I guess. <laughs> he was swimming with his 10 and 3-year-olds in this pool-turned crime scene just before a pickup truck splashed into it. Gary police say a man hit a Honda Accord at the intersection of Chatham Street and Old Apex Road, then sped away before jumping out of the moving truck as it continued down this hill into the pool. Fortunately, the pool area was empty when it happened. Police say that man then jumped into a nearby pond before they arrived on scene. A Russian court extends the arrest of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. Gershkovich will remain detained now until at least the end of November on espionage charges. Gershkovich and his employer denied the allegations and the U.S. government declared him to be wrongfully held. The case has been wrapped in secrecy. Russian authorities haven't detailed what, if any, evidence they've gathered to support the charges. Another issue has been found with the Boeing 737 MAX. Boeing says during factory inspections of its best-selling 737 MAX airplanes, it discovered fastener holes in a pressure bulkhead that were drilled incorrectly. Boeing says not all planes are affected, and this is not an immediate safety issue for the 737 fleet. Previous safety modifications were made to 737 MAX planes after deadly crashes in Ethiopia and Indonesia. If you're from New Jersey, you've heard the debate. 
Does Central Jersey exist? And where would it even be? The long-debated boundaries of the state's regions have now been codified into law. Governor Phil Murphy signed legislation today designating Hunterton, Somerset, Middlesex, and Mercer counties as Central Jersey. Officials hope the designation will help tourism rebound in the region after a sharp drop during COVID. The bill takes effect in 90 days. The debate over Taylor Ham and Pork Roll remains ongoing. Legendary Lakers basketball star Kobe Bryant will be remembered with a monument outside the Lakers stadium in downtown Los Angeles. Bryant spent his entire career with the Lakers, winning five championship rings throughout his 20 seasons with the team. Bryant died in a helicopter crash in 2020, along with one of his daughters and several others. Of course, you know about ChatGPT. You probably even use it. It's the AI tool that produces answers to complex questions in a matter of seconds. But what happens when that revolutionary technology is placed in robots? There is so much promise, but also serious concerns as the robotics field tries to keep their technology in the right hands. Chief Business Correspondent Rebecca Jarvis reports on why we all need to be paying attention to the robot revolution happening before our eyes. Robots, they can already do so much, from picking up tools to delivering products, even running entire factories. We've come a long way in a very short time. Greetings and salutations, my friend. Yes. Five years ago, I met Sophia. Back then, a cutting-edge robot. I'd really like to have a robot cat. Sort of able to hold a conversation. Maybe your robot cat and my real cat could play. Oh, yes, they're definitely cute. Today, with the emergence of generative AI technology like ChatGPT, which lets humans get answers to complex questions in a matter of seconds, it's a whole different ballgame. We were trying to get ChatGPT control a robotic arm, and from a typical robotics point of view, what you would say is like, okay, pick up this block, place it in a specific area, and then, you know, form the logo. We just went ahead and asked, hey, do you know what the Microsoft logo looks like? And it said yes, and was able to actually draw it using code. Robots can now take instructions in English instead of computer code, as you see in this video where researchers direct and help teach the robot to complete simple tasks. It's not just pattern matching. This is now actually creating something. That capability is, is necessary and important for a lot of the things we're going to want to do in robotics. Reshaping medical care, education, and most workplaces. You know, your job may very well in the future, instead of like personally unloading a tractor trailer, you know, continually talk the robot through doing it. Just like the way that the airline pilots now interact with planes is very much collaborating with an autopilot. Right. It's right. not that the autopilot replaced the plane uh, or replaced the pilot. It actually, you know, enables you to do the job more efficient and safely. But there's also the darker side. More reminiscent of a Terminator film or Black Mirror episode. <laughs> Like this footage. Not a movie, but a very real robo-dog, armed with a submachine gun, firing live rounds. Always talking about it because it's always a concern. This is a problem for the category of robotics. Weaponizing general purpose robots is going to make people very, uh, very nervous about seeing these robots around their communities. We wondered how companies at the forefront of developing these new innovations are answering such difficult questions. So our team got an exclusive tour of Agility Robotics state-of-the-art production facility in Pittsburgh. CEO Damian Shelton and CTO Jonathan Hurst showing us around. Um, what is walking? Here, engineers are conducting performance tests and inspections on their autonomous humanoid robot called Digit. We have various gestures that are pre-programmed. We also use this to test out that everything is working properly. These robots can walk, crouch low, reach high, and are built to increase the productivity, efficiency, and wellness of jobs for humans. And we're really focused on warehouse logistics tasks right now, the dull, dirty, dangerous stuff. It's really uh, allowing people to uh, prioritize what they're doing to the things that have uh, a higher return for their employer and are, and are more interesting for the person to do. What we're gonna do is start uh, moving these plastic e-commerce bins uh, these totes um, off of the shelf and on the conveyor belt. 
what Digit is doing right now is fully autonomous. It's scanning its environment, identifying what's around it to make sure it knows exactly where it is in its space. Digit can also be guided by a handheld remote. While I'm telling it what direction to go, it is planning where it's safe to put its feet. And comes with a big red all stop button in case things go seriously wrong. So this is just our fail safe to make sure that everyone stays safe. We took Digit for a stroll outside the warehouse, through the corridors of an office building, walking down hallways, turning around corners with ease before coming to a stop at the front door and giving <laughs> us a bow. Nice day. Digit can also perform outdoor tasks. Handle the curbs, handle the steps. And manage gravel, grass, and troubleshoot obstacles. We've taken them out to the woods before and hiked on trails and, you know, up and down pretty steep hills. And Digit's future is wide open. In this next vision of Digit's coming out, it's, uh, it's got a head, it's got hands, uh, it's got self-charging. Um, and, and really, all of these things are, are function first. You know, we're, we're building a machine that's made for work. But with so much promise, there also comes peril. People are worried about autonomous weapons, and rightly so. And so anytime somebody does something, even a small company, even a small thing, it is something that concerns everybody. And it really harms the ability of everybody else to do good with robotics. That dog video and others like it, prompting Agility and five other leading robotics companies to sign an open letter against the weaponization of their robot technology. Unsurprisingly, roboticists also think about the implications of all the technology that, that we build. We don't want to see our robots causing harm, being weaponized, being used in a military context. The letter that we signed is you know, a recognition to society that, hey, we in the industry can see this as being a problem mm -hmm. uh, and that ultimately this is really a, an identification of uh, you know, a risk that, you know, we would hope that it's broader social conversation around. The letter, more important than ever, as law enforcement across the country debate how to integrate robots into their work. San Francisco considering a controversial proposal to let police robots use deadly force. The SFPD controversy and others, there's a very blurry line between, you know, non-lethal weapons or things that are designed for bomb disposal and potential weaponization. The Board of Supervisors tabling the proposal late last year after significant public backlash, but it's expected to be reconsidered later this year. At the same time, the technology continues to evolve and researchers can see the possibilities. This is definitely not in a stage where we can just like, take it out there and apply it on a bunch of robots. So are you ultimately aiming for the ability to, for me to turn around and tell a robot to warm up my lunch or to deliver this pencil to a friend? Ultimately, yes. A major advancement in a short time. Do you ever get freaked out by your work? Does it scare you? I wouldn't call it fear, but I do. Um, it reminds me, you know, like how much more needs to be done in terms of establishing the right guidelines and having the right kind of framing in mind as we uh, develop these techniques and, and, you know, how we ensure that this doesn't fall in the wrong hands. Microsoft and OpenAI, along with the robotics world, urging caution as we head full throttle into uncharted territory. You know, we can't necessarily prevent all bad things from happening, but with disclosure and shining the light on you know, the underlying systems that let these technologies work, that is uh, you know, a huge step towards making them safe for people. That's gonna require a lot of thoughtful uh, implementation work, and I you know, say my view is people should be very careful about that. This is a completely new enabling thing, and we're right in the middle of that change of that technology, and that is super exciting. Exactly how that happens, it's kind of up to us. So I want to be, bring these robots into the world in a way that is as positive, as helpful, as productive as it can possibly be. Advancements in technology certainly happening before our eyes. Our thanks to Rebecca. Now to a story about how AI is helping a woman unable to speak for nearly two decades and has now regained that ability thanks to artificial intelligence. Here's ABC's Allison Kosick. For 18 years, Ann Johnson hasn't said one word until now. Great to see you were dead. When she was 30 years old, married with kids, Anne had a paralyzing stroke while playing volleyball, robbing her of an ability to communicate other than using a letter board. Now, artificial intelligence has helped give Anne her voice back. You are truly wonderful people. And for the first time in a long time, she spoke with her husband, Bill. 
I was thinking about running to the store. What time will you be home? It was an emotional moment to hear her voice again, um, you know, that we used a clip from her wedding video to kind of restore her voice the way it sounded. A team of doctors and researchers at the University of California, San Francisco and UC Berkeley discovered a way to use Anne's brain signals and translate them into words using artificial intelligence. We have electrodes that sit on the surface of Anne's brain. When she tries to move her mouth as if she was saying a word or a sentence, we decode that activity into sounds and the avatar movements that correspond to the movements that she would have tried to make. Metzger says it's the recent advances in AI that led them to the ability to synthesize speech with the avatar. We decode Anne's brain signals using uh, new AI algorithms, and they're essential to being able to do this work. Absolutely incredible. A clear sign of how AI is also helping us. Our thanks to Allison. That is our show for this hour. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Betrayal. The perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Jerusalem, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. You are joining us on a historic night after former President Trump surrendered for a fourth criminal indictment this year, becoming the first former president in history to have his mugshot taken. Tonight, Trump turned himself in at the Fulton County Jail in Atlanta, involving what prosecutors say is a criminal conspiracy to interfere with the 2020 election. The former president president landed in Atlanta just about after 7 p.m. Eastern time. He walked out of the plane and took a 20 minute ride to the jail. There he was fingerprinted, photographed and went back to the airport. Uh, there Trump spoke for a short time and repeated falsehoods about the election. Many of Trump's 18 alleged co-conspirators have already been booked. Former chief of staff Mark Meadows surrendering today. 
Trump's former attorneys, Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis, and Sidney Powell have also been booked. Remaining co-defendants have until tomorrow to surrender. Trump remains the front runner for the Republican presidential nomination. Trump's processing comes 24 hours after the first Republican primary debate, which he did not attend. Senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky leads us off from Georgia. Tonight, Donald Trump surrendering to authorities at the Fulton County Jail. The former president had already been booked in three other criminal cases. This time was different. Tonight, he was photographed, fingerprinted, and this time he was released on bond. $200,000 and a pledge he won't threaten any potential witnesses, including on social media. As he headed to Atlanta on his private jet, the former president calling it yet another sad day in America. Trump is charged with being the ringleader of a criminal enterprise attempting to overturn the 2020 election and with heading up a pressure campaign against local Republican officials, including that phone call with Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have. Because we won the state. Also on that call, Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows. So, every, Mr. President, everybody is on the line. And just so this is Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. Meadows has been charged, too, and surrendered earlier today. His mug shot right here. Meadows is trying to get his case transferred to federal court. So when will these trials begin? The district attorney, Fonnie Willis, wants to try Trump and his 18 co-defendants together. But tonight, that's in doubt. One defendant, lawyer Kenneth Chesbro, asked for a speedy trial, and the judge agreed, setting a date of October 23rd, less than two months from now. Trump's lawyers quickly weighing in, saying that's way too early to put the former president on trial. Aaron Katursky is there in Georgia for us. You've been there all week. Talk about this mugshot just released a few moments ago. And also, let's talk about what happened at the jail tonight, Aaron. It's an incredible image of former President Trump, who's one of the most widely photographed people in the country, if not the world. And that's why a mugshot was not required in three other jurisdictions where he has been criminally charged. But here, the sheriff was determined to make sure that Trump was treated like every other criminal defendant who comes to this jail for booking. So the mugshot was taken. He was fingerprinted and the jail deputies recorded his height and weight that had been provided by his staff. He did not have to be weighed or measured on site. All told, the former president was here at the jail for less than a half hour before he was gone and headed to the airport. And it marked the first time, Stephanie, that a United States Secret Service motorcade has ever been inside the confines of a state jail facility. Certainly an incredible scene there, Aaron. And, and this booking just marks another first. We just keep, uh, keep uh, hitting on all of these firsts. The first time a motorcade is heading to a jail and the first time that a former president is booked and a mugshot taken of them. A mugshot taken and a former president being required to post bond. Under the terms worked out with the district attorney's office, the former president uh, was released on a $200,000 bond. He needed to post 10% of that in order to be released, and he did that, we're told, with the help of a local bail bondsman, just like many of the other criminal defendants who show up here and who are charged uh, along with Trump in this sprawling racketeering indictment. But that image of the former president glowering into the camera, uh, certainly representative perhaps of, of how the former president feels at the airport under the wing of his private plane. He told reporters that uh, the indictment shouldn't have been brought. He said he had a right to challenge the results of, of an election that he believed was dishonest. Of course, the former president was given that right. He filed more than 60 lawsuits and he lost all but one of them. An extraordinary night, and, and you said it there, Aaron, the president, the former president, not budging from previous statements that we've heard over and over again. Thank you so much, Aaron. Let's get to John Santucci now. John, we have now seen this mugshot. We have spoken about it, but let's talk about it some more. Uh, what do you make of it? It is an intense look 
he, the, pre the former president looks angry. What do you make of this mugshot, John? I, I think you hit it right there. Donald Trump looks it, and he is indeed extremely angry and plays in Stephanie to everything we've been hearing for the last couple of days and weeks that he has been extremely angry about this indictment in particular uh, and attacking DA Fawny Willis and, and really in part, Stephanie, Donald Trump angry about the indictment against himself but angry about all the other people that have been pulled into this because obviously now the big concern is twofold for Team Trump, right? All the legal bills that everybody is going to look to see Donald Trump and others pick up. We know that Rudy Giuliani, among others, have lobbied Donald Trump to help pay for their legal defense, but also for Team Trump, how to keep all 19 on the team. So the biggest concern right now, from what I am told, is that if anyone, any one of those other 18 co-defendants flips against Donald Trump, that they know will make the case stronger against the former president and just make things all the more difficult. And John, like you've covered the former president for a decade. Have you heard from any of your sources about how this evening has played out for Trump once he boarded that plane back to New Jersey and, and just how he may be feeling right now? You know, I haven't spoken to anybody, Stephanie, uh, since he has been airborne. My sense is um, that he was rather, you know, leaning into the fact that he knew he had to go through this for the last couple of days. As I said, angry for sure. Um, but, you know, not something that he is unused to at this point. I do know, as we've reported here, uh, the fact that he had to take a mugshot was bothering him. The fact that it had to come out uh, was bothering him. But now, as we're going to see very shortly, I I I'd say soon enough, Donald Trump and his team are going to take that photo, put it into an email, blast it out for fundraising, and before you know it, there will be a t-shirt with that mugshot front and center. As they move forward in their campaign for the 2024 election, John Santucci, thank you so much. The first presidential primary debate is in the books. Eight Republican candidates fought for airtime. Missing from the stage was, of course, the front runner. Who made the strongest impression? Senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has more. Even though Donald Trump was not in the debate hall, the front runner's presence loomed large. If former President Trump is convicted in a court of law, would you still support him as your party's choice? Please raise your hand if you would. Then former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie speaking up. Someone's got to stop normalizing this conduct, okay? Now, and now whether or not whether or not you believe that the criminal charges are right or wrong, the conduct is beneath the office of President of the United States. Defending Trump at every turn, biotech entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy. President Trump, I believe, was the best president of the 21st century. It's a fact. The 38-year-old multimillionaire from Ohio on his biggest stage yet. So first, let me just address a question that is on everybody's mind at home tonight. Who the heck is this skinny guy with a funny last name? But Ramaswamy's opponents not holding back. I've had enough already tonight of a guy who sounds like <laughs> ChatGPT standing up here. And the last person in one of these debates, Brett, who stood in the middle of the stage and said, What's a skinny guy with an odd last name doing up here was Barack Obama, and I'm afraid we're dealing with the same type of amateur. Now is not the time for on-the-job training. And after Ramaswamy said he would not support increased funding for Ukraine... You have no foreign me, policy experience, and it shows. And you know what? The, it the shows. Foreign policy experience that you Working to stay out of the line of fire, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Do you believe in human behavior is causing climate change. Raise your hand if you do. Look, look, we're not school children. Let's have the debate. I mean, I'm happy to take it to start. <laughs> DeSantis reluctant to take on Trump. Mike Pence pushing him to say whether the vice president did the right thing on January 6th. I, I think the American people deserve to know whether everyone on this stage agrees that I kept my oath to the Constitution that day. There's we, no we more important duty. So, so answer the question. Thing. I've, I've answered this before. So yeah. Our thanks to Rachel for bringing us that debate recap. Vladimir Putin breaks his silence on the mysterious plane crash that reportedly killed mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin, who led a mutiny against Russian forces two months ago. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge is in Ukraine.
Tonight, Vladimir Putin breaking his silence after that private jet belonging to mercenary boss Yevgeny Prigozhin broke up midair, crashing to the ground. With US officials now saying it's likely Prigozhin was killed. Prigozhin and Putin close allies before the mercenary boss and his men marched on Moscow. Putin calling that a stab in the back. Today, the Russian president initially offering what he called his sincerest condolences to the families of all 10 victims on board the plane. But then calling Prigozhin someone with a complex destiny and making a veiled reference to that mutinous march on Moscow, saying the Wagner boss made, quote, serious mistakes in life. Tonight, new details on what may have caused Prigozhin's plane to suddenly plunge from 28,000 feet. The Associated Press reporting that a preliminary US intelligence assessment found the crash was intentionally caused by an explosion. The Pentagon not commenting on whether there was an explosion on board, but ruling out the idea that a missile shot the plane down. Nothing to indicate, no information to suggest that there was a surface-to-air missile. Today, supporters of Prigozhin laying flowers outside Wagner's offices in Russia, with a Ukrainian official claiming Wagner fighters who moved to Belarus after their failed mutiny are now heading back into Russia. Ukrainian President Zelensky saying Ukraine played no part in bringing Prigozhin's plane down, saying everyone understands who is involved. Tom Sufi Burridge joins us now from Ukraine. Tom, Ukraine is now trying to appeal to Wagner fighters? Yes, Stephanie, Wagner fighters were very loyal to Yevgeny Prigozhin. Tonight, the Ukrainian military appealing to those fighters who have not committed war crimes to join Ukraine and to finish their march on Moscow. Stephanie? An interesting turn of events. Thank you so much, Tom. Back here, new details about a deadly mass shooting at a biker bar in Orange County, California, the 465th mass shooting in America this year. Three people and the shooter were killed, five others wounded. Authorities say the shooter was a retired police sergeant and was targeting his estranged wife. Here's our Will Carr. Tonight, authorities believe the retired police officer who opened fire at this Orange County bar killing three was targeting his estranged wife. We have a significant number of patients, possibly totaling nine. It was just around 7 p.m. last night. Patrons gathering at Cook's Corner Bar to hear a live band and enjoy spaghetti night. When authorities say John Snowling started shooting, striking his estranged wife, Marie, in the face. She was rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Mr. Snowling, the suspect, then started randomly shooting at patrons within Cook's Corner. There is a massive police presence by the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Sources tell ABC News investigators believe when Snowling was out of ammo, he ran to his vehicle. Orange County Sheriff's deputies had arrived on scene confronting Snowling against his truck. The suspect began firing multiple rounds at our deputies. Multiple deputies were involved in the shooting, and we do know and do believe that it was a gunfire from those deputies that ultimately took the life of the individual. Tonight, the sheriff crediting his deputy's quick response for preventing a bigger tragedy. Undoubtedly, uh, more individuals may have lost their lives. We still have much more to get to here. Much of the world does not have easy access to clean drinking water, a necessity of a healthy life. UNICEF tells us the crisis that's making it even worse for families around the globe. But next, the system a Japanese power company is using to release treated radioactive water into the ocean after years of planning. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story, 
here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, I'm Matt Gutman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Tokyo Electric Power Company released a video of its operation to discharge treated radioactive water from the wrecked Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean today. The video showed TEPCO workers seated at the plant's control room turning a key to begin the water release. The Japanese government signed off on the plan two years ago and it was given a green light by the UN nuclear watchdog last month. A drag show in the Lebanese capital, Beirut, was cut short late by an angry crowd of conservative Christians screaming homophobic chants. That's according to Reuters. The hosts and a group of attendees ran to the changing area as a group of men could be heard gathering outside the venue, loudly spitting and shouting that they were disgusted at the event. The group hid for about 40 minutes, during which the two performers removed makeup and their fake eyelashes in case the conservative group broke in. Thankfully, attendees departed safely after security forces eventually arrived and dispersed the crowd. Drone images show at an apartment building in Chile that was left on the edge of a landslide after heavy rains hit central region, a central region of the country overnight. Local authorities said part of the hillside and street collapsed, leaving the luxury apartment complex about 50 feet from the landslide. 25 people residing in the building were evacuated. Heavy rain there, but a lack of clean water in other parts of the world. Approximately one in four people worldwide do not have easy access to clean drinking water. The water crisis is here and climate change is making it even worse. So what can we do? It is World Water Week and joining us now for more is Paloma Escudero, UNICEF's Special Advisor on Climate Advocacy. Thank you so much for your time. Clean water is so crucial, especially for families and children. Can you talk about the importance of it in all aspects of life? Well, for when you're a child, if you have no access to safe water in your day-to-day, -day, you have your health at risk. And in 2022, we saw more than 30 countries where children were suffering cholera, where children were dying out of a simple diarrhea in a proportion that we have not seen in recent history for us. Water is life, especially for the little ones, but nowadays, we have 450 million children who have not access to safe drinking water every day. Gosh, those numbers are so high. It's, it's awful. There's so many kids that are suffering right now, as you said. Can you explain how climate change is making the water crisis even worse? Well, climate change is impacting every crisis in the world, but especially it is impacting the frequency and the dimension of the natural disasters. 75% of all natural disasters these days are linked to water. We have seen drought, we have seen hurricanes, cyclones, in a proportion that it was not unthinkable few, few years ago. And that water-related disasters are really uh, provoked and related to climate change, but also means that we are not always ready or prepared to be facing the impact of those uh, disasters in millions of people, but especially the impact in the lives of the most vulnerable children in this planet.
Now, let's talk about flooding. We've seen horrible flooding situations in so many different parts of the world, Chile and now Pakistan, one year after major floods there caused billions of dollars of damage and affected 33 million people. Are you concerned that entire communities may have to change where and how they live as floods keep inundating areas and are doing so more frequently? Absolutely. Flooding is changing our lives, especially for the millions of people. For instance, in Pakistan, a year after the, the floods, still 8 million people are living in flooded areas. Many millions have decided to move to a different place, but a lot of people cannot move. They really have to stay in those places, even if they are living among or surrounded by infested waters. Still, 8 million people need assistance, 4 million children. And for instance, the basics of food aid, 1.5 million children need nutrition assistance even a year after the floods um, happen because their parents have not recovered their livelihoods. The theme of this year's World Water Week is seeds of change. You mentioned assistance is definitely needed, but what other innovative solutions can help change this water crisis, this situation? Innovation is the key for all of us to be able to cope and to develop new water sanitation hygiene systems that will allow millions of people to be coping with these uh, enormous uh, natural disasters that are going to be we are going to be facing in the present but also in the coming future in the case of unicef now we depend fully on solar hubs in solar systems that will allow the water, the sanitation in, in installations to keep working even in the middle of the worst floods or in the middle of the worst uh, droughts. It is very important to be thinking about sustainability, how we are going to be helping. Well, Paloma, thank you so much. We are thankful for the work that you're doing at UNICEF and hopefully so many families and children especially get the assistance that they need. Paloma Escudero, thank you. And still to come, women still aren't prevalent in many fields, including architecture. The direct approach now being taken to encourage the next generation. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We are honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. Finally tonight, girl power. In the world of architecture, women are underrepresented in the field, so an effort is underway to turn that around by inspiring and empowering the next generation with hands-on experience. Here's Robin Roberts. I just love to build and create and design, and I would always look at buildings and say, I wish I could do something like that. Down in Dallas. Where's the measuring tape? They need to get some measurements over here. These young girls are building the blueprint for their futures. 
We did the X because it was to put more support because this is a rock climbing wall. It's more enjoyable to get hands in and understand what's going on. Exploring the skills it takes to work in fields like science and tech. When you're using a drill, you put your hand at the top of the drill and push down with force so it can go in easier. It's only 23.3% of women in architecture, and I thought that was a great opportunity for girls to get involved. Also, less than 1% of architects are black women. We got a couple more hammers over here that need to help out. That hits the nail on the head for the program's founder, Kelly Flowers, who runs the organization Women Leading Technology. I want you to try different fields, try different industries, have those hands-on experiences so you can find what you love to do. Kelly and her team teaching girls crash courses in architecture, <laughs> building playhouses from start to finish, all for a purpose. We actually build these homes and we donate them to women and children's shelters. This one that we're building today, we're building a Barbie dream house that we're building for kids at a community center. Each four foot tall unit providing joy and comfort to their community. They're innovative, they're creative, they're out of the box thinkers. And these babies, this would have been a mansion. Do you understand? The girls behind the drills. We are hope to one day transform tiny homes into shelter for the homeless. We need all different ideas to kind of figure out a way of making buildings that actually help people and keep people safe. I always like giving back to the community as much as I can and doing what I love. Whatever it is that you want to do, do it. changing an industry with support and exposure to the field. Our thanks to Robin. That's our show for tonight. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Imagine if you had an institution where it was almost impossible to be held accountable. What happened with the police made me scared of them. No mother should have to bury their child. Amir Locke was killed in a botched no-knock warrant situation. How these cops operate in this country has been America's dirty secret. Because of the color of his skin, he didn't have a chance. That's the sound of the police. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. I'm Whit Johnson, reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is DeMarco Morgan. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate 50 years of hip hop here at ABC News Live. Now, you can't celebrate the genre of a generation without Jay-Z, but there would be no Jay-Z without the legends who came before him. DJ Cool Herc and Coke LaRock, just to name a few. Now, over the next half hour, we'll look at hip hop at 50, from the battle brewing over free speech and rap lyrics with Miami's own two live crew, to the streetwear of the genre, dominating runways worldwide. But we begin with the night hip hop was born August 11th, 1973, at a back to school party where Coke LaRock says he picked up the mic for the very first time and became the first MC, creating the blueprint for what we now know as rap. But he says many of his contributions have not been recognized. Five decades after the birth of the music genre, he may be able to turn his street cred into legal credibility. Our Mike Muse takes us back to the Bronx, where it all started. It's easy to pass by this building and assume it's just like the thousands of others in New York City. But as the story goes, here in the rec room on Cedric Avenue in the Bronx, hip hop, a multi-billion dollar industry was born. Now thinking right, back to right. 1973, right. here is this party for back to school, change the trajectory of music. The beginnings of hip hop was shaped by the sounds, movements, and culture of the time. I know in 1973, we had Gladys Knight and the Pips. All we had Aretha right, Franklin right, Rocksteady. Right, right. We had Marvin Gaye, Let's Get It On. Then my people was, I love the Delphonic. All I know is la, 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 la. The incredible music of the Motown sound and soul music and Jimmy Castor and James Brown and people like that. Everyone wanted to be like James Brown. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. People were getting assassinated, MLK, JFK, Malcolm X, RFK. So we came out of that era and we were searching for something to give us some comfort and some escapism. We may come from dirt, but we're not dirt. On August 11th, 1973, Clive Campbell, better known as DJ Cool Herc, threw a party ushering in a genre of music that's become a global cultural phenomenon. And while Herc made history on the ones and twos, by his side, a man known to everyone as Coke LaRock. Is that when you decided to pick up the microphone? Because during that time period, you were both a DJ as well in your own regard, yeah. right? Yeah, I grabbed the mic the first time I got in that room. You did. Coke says that was the moment he became the first MC of hip hop. At another party, Coke remembers someone stepping up to challenge him. And that's when I put it all together with, I said, let me introduce myself, Ronnie D. I give no mercy, take no prisoners. I am that first G money man. I got a G or better any type of weather, cold or hot, rain or not. Born in an orphan, fought like a slave, chucking and fighting is all Coke LaRock played. Coke LaRock says he coined the lines and phrases that many now associate with other artists, but you won't hear him featured on any of those tracks. One night I'm at this party and everybody was doing this as I'm talking, like you said, a rhythm. So I was like, wow, they moving side to side. So I start saying, you rock and you don't stop. You rock and you don't stop. Because you're now listening to the sounds of Coke LaRock. It's a lyric often associated with Africa Bombada and the Soul Sonic Forces 1982 hit, Planet Rock. I can say it now. We was at the motel on the turnpike, right? Now, I had a wife, everything, everything. So we at the motel, me and, me and somebody, we came out. And somebody else came out the other door with somebody they weren't supposed to be with. We looked at each other, Mike, and then I realized, and I put it to words. Hotel, motel, you don't tell, I don't tell. Another familiar line, heard in what's often called the first mainstream hip-hop track, Rapper's Delight. Do you feel like hip-hop owes you anything? If Herc is the father of hip-hop, and that's, everybody know that. If Herc came out of there, and I picked the mic up, and I came out of there, why am I not known for that? Where's the royalty money of this? 
Attorney Lita Rosario Richardson's expertise sits at the intersection of entertainment and intellectual property. Lita works to rectify the drawbacks in the music industry that left many legacy artists without ownership of their work. Is Coke LaRock entitled to anything? So, my first question for Coke LaRock, did he ever record any of his rhymes? And I heard him say that he used to make mixtapes on eight tracks. Mm -hmm. So if he recorded some of those rhymes on those eight tracks, he has some evidence of when they were created. Mm -hmm. But even if he didn't, he can actually record those rhymes now and file them at the copyright office. Because copyright subsist from the date of creation, not from the date that you file your copyright registration. Why is that important for his grandkids? Yes, and that's what this is all about, legacy. Royalties can continue to be paid or money can continue to be earned for a time period equal to the life of the last surviving co-author of the work plus 70 years. With hits like Fight the Power, rapper Chuck D of the group Public Enemy has never shied away from social and political discourse. Now co-founding the Hip Hop Alliance, providing resources for hip hop and R&B creators similar to a union. We've been part of industries that have made billions of dollars. Okay, where's the retirement fund? Where's the health care? You know, um, what's the advice and, and the direction for artists that come in? Joining him in the fight is another trailblazing MC, fellow Hip Hop Alliance co-founder Curtis Blow, whose classic track, The Breaks, became the first certified gold rap song. Cause I'm Curtis Blow, and I want you to know that these are the breaks. We have the Legends Fund, which is a nonprofit 501c3 organization that has emergency funds that we are building for legends who fall upon dire straits. We're out to make people uh, live their lives more abundantly and not just survive, but to thrive. The electric feelings and funky vibes of those groundbreaking nights on display at Legacy NYC in Soho. This one says, pays tribute to New York's number one DJs, Cool Herc and Coke LaRock at the Disco Palace. I didn't see it really even going all the way. I knew we giving good parties and we doing that, but it was so hard to see the future. Now what remains of those parties have the potential to solidify Coke's claims on the impact he made in hip hop. Now, we also, too, Lita, had the chance to sit with Coke and go down to an art gallery in Soho that had a wonderful exhibit mm -hmm. that showcased flyers. Could an artifact like that mm -hmm. give any establishment? Yeah, it's certainly evidence. It's evidence. You know, him and, and Cool Herc who were out there doing this, it, it sets up a date. It doesn't answer the ultimate fact, but it's certainly evidence that contributes to the point. A landmark past and a story told through word of mouth evidenced on pieces of paper may be the key Coke Rock has been looking for all along. Coke Rock, what's happening, man? This is Mike Muse from ABC. After you and I spoke, uh, I interviewed Lita Rosario Richardson, who is a well-known entertainment attorney. So what I asked her was, you know, does she think that you have a right to any claims in hip hop? What she said though, Coke, is that you do have a right to go after your copyright. That sound great, that sound great. That sound real positive. How does that make you feel? It, it makes you feel good because like I said, it's really for my grandkids, kids beyond and just to know the truth. The Rock's hopes to earn a piece of the pie now line the legacy he wants to leave for his family. I'm talking now because um, I felt God left me here to talk now because at the beginning and going through the part of hip hop, I was way ahead of my time. Got to show some love for the boogie down Bronx. There are many things to Mike Muse for that report. Uh, when we come back, we head to the 305 where rap battle was brewing against the government, the boycotts, the arrests, and the landmark Supreme Court decision that paved the way for many artists today. That's next.
sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. All right, welcome back. We head next to Miami, the city that served as the ring where hip hop heavyweights, two live crew, uh, fought the ultimate rap battle, the battle to protect their First Amendment right to free speech. With the Young Thug trial currently underway in Atlanta, there's a renewed focus on what's being said in songs and what really went down. But he's not the first to have lyrics on trial. Victor Okendo explains how two live crew doubled down on their lyrics that, in their words, could be as nasty as they want to be. 1980s Miami, beaches, glow, and bass. Two Live Crew with their unique sound and explicit lyrics would not only change music in Miami, but the country, becoming one of the most controversial hip hop groups in history. There was nothing rap about Miami at the time. There was dance music, party music, you know, Caribbean music, things like that but there were no rappers in the marketplace at that time. We were really just doing music for Miami, uh, not knowing that it would catch on throughout the country. It caught on. Two Live Crew sold over three million albums during their time as a group. The main lineup included Uncle Luke, Mr. Mix, Brother Marquis, and the late Fresh Kid Ice. But the lyrics, album covers, and performances brought both fame and legal troubles. Outrage followed the release of their 1989 album, As Nasty As They Want To Be, with a cover showing the male group members standing under women whose assets were front and center. One of the most popular songs, Multiple counties in Florida tried to ban their album from being sold after a federal judge ruled it to be obscene. Record store owners were even arrested for selling the album. Did you expect that kind of response? No, not really. I mean, you know, it was a shock. It was a shock. In 1990, Uncle Luke and Fresh Kid Ice were arrested during a performance. We knew we was going to get arrested. You knew you were going to get arrested, so why go ahead and go through with the performance? Why was that so important for you? It was, it was so important. It was so important for me because I knew that, I knew that we were, one, we were under attack. We were under attack because it was hip hop. Say no censorship. But as the campaign against Two Live Crew ramped up, so did the campaign to protect freedom of speech with the creation of Rock the Vote, which launched their first PSA with the Queen of Pop herself. Dr. King, Malcolm X, freedom of speech is as good as sex. Attorney Bruce Rogo fought on the group's behalf in multiple cases, helping overturn the obscenity ruling. I said, you know, it's not just language, it's music. This is this is a form of art, uh, and so it's protected. The defendant is not guilty. I said, I think we can win. I said, but even if you lose, you'll win. And he said, what does that mean? I said, well, if the government says people can't have something, everyone is going to want to have it. And then you'll win. The record will be a big hit. And that's how we started. Through the court cases, backlash from lawmakers, and protest against the group, Two Life Crew kept climbing the charts. But another battle was brewing over parody, the sampling of other artists' music, specifically Roy Orbison's hit song, Pretty Woman. Pretty Woman. On the clean version of As Nasty As They Want To Be, titled As Clean As They Want To Be, they included a parody of the song. And this one would go all the way to the Supreme Court in 1994. Pretty Woman, we didn't really think of it like we was really doing anything out the way or different than what we normally do. The um, publishing company and the record company that had the Roy Orbison music looked at it as a money grab. They didn't look at it like it was a form of art. They looked at it as a form of stealing somebody else's work. They're supposed to be singing a clean version. What's happening? After being denied permission to sample the copyrighted song, Uncle Luke and company decided to publish the song anyway as a parody. 
prompting a lawsuit from the label behind the original Pretty Woman. Two Live Crew's song was a parody that made fair use of the original. In a unanimous decision, the justices ruled in favor of Two Live Crew, setting the precedent for fair use and parody. And so that was a great case. So he made law really on two fronts. He made law in terms of the First Amendment and obscenity, and he made law in terms of copyright law. Not too often that a rapper gets to make both federal constitutional law and federal copyright law. I knew that if we don't take on this fight uh, for hip hop, that people of today wouldn't be able to do it. Now there's one ongoing case that has put into question what constitutes freedom of speech and what could be used in a court of law. Rapper Young Thug. Rapper Young Thug. Young Thug. All eyes are on rapper Young Thug. A judge will decide if his own rap lyrics can actually be used in a RICO case against him. What are your opinions on his case and any similarities that you might see with what Two Life Crew went through? I, I don't ever think any uh, prosecutor should use lyrics uh, against the artist. Writing is the art form, you know, and you have to you have to write from the standpoint of what's going on today in the streets. Mr. Mix with a different record. opinion. It's just foolish to me that a person would say that we murdered some guys. I think that they're learning now that if you do something like that, it's fair game because you're the one who put it out there. They didn't put it out there, you put it out there.